Not today, Satan. I'm just kidding. We're just probably having technical difficulties. It's all right. Uh, I want to say good morning to all of you uh, who are here. It's really good to have you today. If I have not had a chance to meet you yet, uh, my name is Al, and I'm the lead pastor at Compassion Christian. And I want to say a special welcome to all of our members and regular attenders, as well as um, uh, say welcome to any of, the, any of you who might be new to Compassion. If this is your very first time uh, being here today, we're very privileged uh, we consider it an honor that you're here, and uh, we're, we've prayed for uh, people to come, people who are new. And so if this is your first time with us today, I hope, first of all, that you've been warmly welcomed by the people in the church. I hope that uh, you have, um, you've been able to, to feel the presence of the Lord here. I hope that God is going to speak to you. Uh, so would you do us a special favor? Uh, inside of your worship folder, there's a Connect card, and that's a communication uh, device for us. Uh, we would love for you to use that and just let us know about your uh, your time here today. Just let us know about you. And as our way of saying thank you for completing that card, uh, we do have a, a $5 Starbucks gift card that we'll give you in exchange for that card if you'll go to, to the uh, guest services table, the circular table, as you're leaving today. Uh, we'd really, really appreciate that. Uh, I also uh, want to acknowledge that today is Veterans Day. And so um, we, do we have any veterans here? Um, and if you are here, if you, if you served in our military forces, would you stand, please, so that we can honor you? If you've served in the military. All right. Thank you. We thank you for your service. Thank you very much. And so let's, uh, let's make today a very special day uh, in, in that regard as well. I also wanted to give you kind of an update on um, some of the things that are going on in the building. And so we've got some pictures here. Um, I think the first picture is going to be funny. Um, <laughs> this, was, this is actually inverted. Um, this, is the, this is not exciting to you, but it's exciting to me. This is the bathroom for the basement. Uh, that were, so that's the piping that's coming up. And so I apologize that, that that is not the right way. But this is the trenching that they had to dig out through about eight inches of concrete and tile floor to get to that. So that was not easy. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. I think there's some more yeah, pictures of that. So just do like this and you can really, um, you can really see that. All right, and then the next uh, couple, again, man, I'm really excited about that trenching if you can't tell. Um, but these are going to be the bathrooms downstairs. And okay, one more. All right, so this is what's really got me excited as well. Uh, if you've driven by the building, we're starting to put the preliminary paints, uh, the preliminary coats of paint on the outside. It's going to be a gray color. You see the window uh, f features here that are going to be the board and batten, which is the board and batten here. We're going to put a cedar cross on the front, and then we're getting new windows probably after Thanksgiving. So that's coming along as well. And so if you happen to be in the area and you want to stop by, you see someone there, um, we can, we'd love for you to see that. Uh, I, I may have spoken a little bit prematurely about giving tours because I don't think we're quite ready for that as far as safety for people walking through the building, uh, but we're getting closer every single day. So uh, just thank you again for your prayers, your support, and uh, everything that, that's happening to make that become a reality. It's going to be, uh, it won't be long. We just don't know exactly when, okay? So there we go. Now, I want to start today by doing a, uh, an informal survey of the congregation. Now, you might think in a room like this size that I would know everybody, I'd know everything about you, I'd know everything about your background, but actually, that's not true. And so what I want to do today is I want to just take an informal survey, and your participation is just going to be by the raising of your hand. Uh, that's it, raising your hand, and then you can put it down after I, after I uh, get a chance to explain what we're talking about here. So I know that there are some of you in this room who don't know me. You probably don't trust me necessarily because you have no reason to, but there are other people in the room that, have, that keep coming back for some reason every Sunday, so maybe you trust me just a little bit. Um, and so I just want to let you know this is a safe place, but I want to ask you questions about you and your background. And so when you're answering... Honesty, obviously, is going to be very, very important because it's to engage at a level of communication. We have to be honest with each other. And so let's start with that because there's a point, there's a point to all of these questions, okay? So here's the first one. How many of you, by show of hands, did not grow up in a Christian home? How many of you did not grow up in a Christian home? So keep those hands up for a minute. 
You can look around for a, a moment, be nosy, look around, okay? So you grew up in homes where your parents didn't talk to you about Jesus, or you can put your hands down now. They did not lead you to him, so you did not grow up in Christian homes, all right? So by show of hands, how many of you did grow up? in Christian homes. How many of you did grow up in Christian So look around. Look, look at all the, this is a, a wide variety, okay, a wide number. So uh, your parents did talk to you about Jesus, okay, hands down, hands down. Now, how many of you, by show of hands, left the faith of your childhood, sowed your wild oats, and then you've come back to the faith? How many of you left the faith of your childhood, sowed your wild oats, and then came back? All right, so you can still look around. All right, look around. It's okay. Hands down. How many of you came to Christ after your 20th birthday? How many of you came to Christ after your 20th birthday? Okay. How many of you came to Christ after your 30th birthday? How many of you came to Christ after your 40th birthday? Your 50th birthday? And we'll just stop right there, right? Okay, everybody's like, okay, you're, you're, getting, you're starting to meddle now. I don't want to know. Um, so how many of you, by show of hands, are from homes where your parents are still happily married? You're, you're from homes where your parents are still happily married. Kids, I'll make sure my kids are raising my hands there. Um, uh, so how many of you, okay, hands down, how many of you are from homes where your parents were divorced either early on or at some point since you left the house? Where your parents divorced? How many of you had parents who divorced? All right, let's do a few more. This is where, again, the matter of trust has to be there and honesty as well. How many of you would say, would describe your upbringing, your, your socioeconomic level as that you grew up poor? How many of you would say that you grew up poor? Okay, how many of you would say that you grew up in kind of a middle class type of family? All right, all right. So how many of you um, have a master's level education or above? Master's level education or above, just by show of hands. Okay, we got a few. How many of you, uh, again, a safe space here, how many of you have a GED or, or the equivalent only? Is a GED or an equivalent only? All right. So there are a few others of us who, who, are, who are different, right? We're, we're not all the same. And so um, one more question, one more question. How many of you had a history of drugs or alcohol abuse or some other type of abuse in your background? How many of you have that? Alcohol abuse, drug abuse, um, emotional, physical abuse. All right, so, so the, I know it's a harder question to answer. So the reason I'm asking you all that today is to get you to see that, that if you ever had this notion or this idea that you have to be a certain type of person before you can come to church or before you can come to Christ or that God can save you, I'm here to dispel that myth. And the myth is that there's a type of person who becomes a Christian, and even in our sample size this morning, you, know, you can challenge that, right? You can challenge it. I mean, we're all over the map in this room. Some people in this room grew up in homes where their mom and their dad talked about Jesus, and they told you about uh, the, the wonderful love and grace of God. They showed that grace to you. So some of you grew up in that. Uh, some of you had the, the gospel communicated to you, and others of you, uh, us did not. And then there are others who come in here today and maybe for just a few years now, you've been clean and sober. Like you have been battling an addiction and you're clean now and you've been walking in that freedom for a while. Then there are those who have been abused in this group growing up. And then there are those who have been, who have been loved very well growing up. And then there are those who are skeptical by nature. So what we're seeing here is that there are all kinds of people that have gotten saved from even within our congregation. What we're seeing here is that it doesn't have to be a certain type of person. What we're learning is that God can save anyone and God can save any particular type of person and He is not dependent upon certain circumstances. And so that singular truth today blows my mind because of how He goes about doing it. God is not in need of any particular set of circumstances to save you. God doesn't need you to have grown up in Ned Flanders' house to save you. God doesn't need you to, to have been strung out on cocaine for a decade to save you. God can save anyone, right? He can save anyone. And so there is not a, a, a type that God is looking for for a conversion. In fact, the Bible tells us uh, that, that God can save anyone. Now, we can even look in, in Christian history and see this for ourselves. C.S. Lewis 
For example, one of the, the most well-known Christian writers of, of all time grew up a militant atheist. He was Oxford educated, had all kinds of uh, learning about him. And the last thing he wanted was to be converted. And yet the Bible says that, uh, uh, rather the Bible, his biography says that God snuck up on him. And Lewis was, in his words, surprised by joy. He wrote, I was dragged, kicking and screaming, the most reluctant convert in all the world into the kingdom. That's how C.S. Lewis described himself. Or John Wesley, who was the founder of the, the Methodist church. He was a failed, uh, he was a fanatical, rather, son of a minister, a missionary who did not do very well in America. He had a great theological mind, but he had so many problems. And one day, He's sitting in a chapel in England. He is contemplating his failures uh, as a missionary, and he opened his heart to God. And he said that his heart was strangely warmed, and now the Methodist Church is one of the results of all of his life's work simply because he got converted. God can save anybody. And the reason I tell you that is that God is able to save anyone. Therefore, he wants to save everyone. That's what God wants. And he looks down at his church, and he wants his church to be his messengers because God is the one who simply saves. And the prophet Isaiah said something that I want you to see today. He, he wrote this about the Lord. He said, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. So what I want you to know is that God does not look at anyone he does not look at you, he does not look at me, and he does not say, you know what, you're really a big mess. Your life is all over the map. Your life is beyond repair. God doesn't look at anybody and say, you know what, there's too much drama involved in your life for me to save you. God doesn't say, well, you've made your life such a mess that I really can't do anything about it. Now, I don't know if you think that there is a particular type of person that should come to church. Or if you think there's a particular type of person that should not come to church. And I don't know how you grew up, but what I've noticed is, is that the people who didn't grow up in church, like have no reservations about who they will invite, about who they would like to see come to Christ. But it's the people who grew up in the church who have this idea and this notion, oh, we can't have those type of people coming to our church. We can't let those type of people in. Friends, God can save anyone, and therefore he wants to save everyone. And I don't know if you believe, even on a more personal level, that there are some people in your life that, that you don't think you, you can actually reach. Maybe there's some people in your life that you think God would have a really difficult time reaching that person. You see, the reason we would ever entertain such an absurd notion is because we have a list of people that we don't think fit into the church. Let's just admit it. We have a, we have a mental list of, the certain, of certain people that would not fit. We have this idea, this description of a type of person that we want to see come through our doors, and then if they're not in that, then, then we don't think God can save them. But what I want you to see today is that it's really awesome to think about how God saves, and it's awesome to think about where God saves, but I want to draw your attention over these next few weeks to whom he saves. I want to draw your attention and, and get your mind thinking and your heart open to the fact that God can save anyone and that his message is for everyone. God's message is for everyone. So today we're starting out a, a new series, a new teaching series called City on a Hill. And I want you to know where we're getting this from, where, where this is coming straight from the Word of God. But listen to what Jesus said as recorded by Matthew. Now I'm going to read to you from the English Standard Version. Um, but if you look in Matthew chapter 5, the verse is going to be up on the screen. Here's what he said. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do, we, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, this scripture is the inspiration for our teaching series over the next three weeks. Now, you might be familiar with one phrase from that verse, uh, from that passage, the phrase, city on a hill. 
But long before politicians like JFK and Ronald Reagan used that metaphor to cast a vision for a nation, Jesus used it to cast a vision for the church. Jesus said, here's what I want my followers to be. And when Jesus said those words, he had in mind, probably on one level, the city of Jerusalem. Because the city of Jerusalem was literally a city set on a hill. And then when it was lit up at night, people could see it for miles around. So that's what he had in mind on one level. But on the other level, he had, he had in mind that this is how his followers would be. That his followers' lives as the church would be like a city on a hill. In fact, N.T. Wright, a New Testament scholar, wrote this. He said his followers were to be like that. Their deep, heartfelt keeping of God's laws would be a sign to the nations around them that the one God, the Creator, the God of Israel, was the one that they should worship. You see, that is our job no matter where we go, no matter what season of life we're in, no matter how motivated or how deflated we are, God says you are to be the light of the world. And so the idea behind this series is that for the church to be a city on a hill in Delaware, for us to be a city on a hill church, here's what I want to, to remind us of today. A city on a hill church loves and pursues all the people God wants to save. Now, that's not just the, the fanatical ramblings of a pastor who has this ideal vision of what the future could be. No, this is the Word of God, and this is what God's Word says should happen. And so, for the next three weeks, we're going to talk about the type of people that God saves. And then we're going to use that as our marching orders as an attempt to expand the kingdom of God in our little corner of the city of Delaware. So, I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning and take your message notes out. Turn to the Gospel of Luke. So if you turn to the Gospel of Luke, you'll find the first passage that we're going to look at today. We're going to be in a couple of places in Luke chapter 7, and we'll begin around verse 36. And this is going to show us the type of person that God wants to save. And I'll begin reading in verse 36. <clears throat> it says, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman, but he said to Simon, so get that, he turned toward the woman, but he was saying it to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any, any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. So the reason they do that is because everybody wore sandals and the dusty roads would, would cause their feet to be dirty. And so one of the signs of hospitality was have a, someone, a servant there to wash their feet. Okay, so that's the context of that. Verse 45, you did not give me a kiss, which means a greeting, but this woman from the time I entered has not, has not stopped kissing my feet. You do not put oil on my head. She has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So what I want you to notice today is just very just one little thing about this passage one thing about this passage that will help you and I become a city on a hill type of church we need to realize that Jesus saved a woman with a checkered past Jesus saved someone whose life was on display for everyone to see and Luke says that she was a woman who had lived a sinful life but if you go to other translations what you realize is they actually render it she was a woman of the city 
Now, it doesn't mean that she had a flat downtown overlooking the river. It doesn't mean that she was an urbanite. No, what it means is she was a prostitute. She was a woman of the city, and everybody in that room knew it. So we've got this prostitute who has wandered into this inner sanctum, this table, this house of a Pharisee named Simon, and everybody is eating, and then when she comes into the room, everybody stops. Everybody holds their breath. Everybody wonders, what is she going to do? Simon, the master of the feast, if you will, the one who, who got all this together, has this inner monologue about himself. He's like, wait a minute. He's, he's thinking to himself, why is Jesus allowing this prostitute to be in his presence? Why is he allowing her to carry on the way, she, the way she's carrying on? I mean, no one else heard what Simon was thinking, or so he thought. He's having this inner monologue, and this is what's really scary about Jesus, right? When Jesus is there and he can read your thoughts. What are you thinking about? Jesus will ask you, well, uh, you already know. And that's what he says to Simon. And so Simon is thinking this, and Jesus is going to address him in a moment. But I want you to imagine, because some of the, the, the ways that I think Scripture really comes alive for us is for us to imagine ourselves in that scene for a moment. Imagine that we are one of the invited guests... We're not Jesus, we're not Simon, we're not the woman, but we're there and we're watching as this woman comes in. Okay, so, so imagine it. You're there, everybody's reclining at the table, and all of a sudden this prostitute comes in and she has this jar of perfume that she breaks and the smell of this perfume begins to fill the room and then we look and, and what's happening? We look at this woman and she looks at Jesus. We can see the eye contact she's having and she has this bottom lip start to quiver. And it, it always reminds me of um, um, the Little House on the Prairie, Pa Ingalls, Michael Landon, like every episode type of lip quiver. You know what I'm talking about? It's like she, she's looking at Jesus and she's, she's thinking, he knows everything about me. He knows everything about my past. He knows where I was last night. He knows what I'm trying to get out of, but he knows where I've been. And so all of a sudden she is overwhelmed with this, this sense of being in the presence of God and it's overwhelming to her. And when she can no longer control her emotions, the word says that she threw herself on the floor at his feet. She just throws herself down. I mean, she is overwhelmed with shame and disgust at where her life was. And here she is. She's seeking restoration and forgiveness. Now in the room is not just you, not just me, right? But in the room there are other Pharisees. And the Pharisees are these religious guys who, who take pride in the fact that they live morally upright lives. They know the Word of God. They apply the Word of God. They teach the Word of God. They expect people to follow the Word of God like they do. And so the Pharisees are there and they're watching this scene play out. And it's very clear that the Pharisees got pleasure out of her shame that they love to see her grovel because if she's dirty, they're clean. I mean, there's nothing better. You, you never feel better about yourself when you're around someone really sinful. So it's this classic story of self-righteousness. No desire to see people with a checkered past find freedom. And so here's this woman at the feet of Jesus. She's covered in snot all over her face, saliva and tears all mixed together, her hair sticking to her face, and she lets her hair down and begins to clean the feet of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but, but when, when I really think about what's happening in this scene, it is an emotionally gripping and somewhat devastating uh, spectacle to watch. Because here's a person who's so utterly broken about her life, and anyone with a heart would look at that and, and just be moved to tears, but not the Pharisee. Not Simon. Because all he can think about is this. All he can think is this. If Jesus knew about her past, he would make her stop. He would make her get up and get out. That's what he would do. And this is where Jesus gets scary. He answers Simon. Simon didn't say what he said out loud to the, to the crowd. No one in that room would have heard it. But Jesus answered it, answered him by telling a story. And Jesus, I want you to notice, I read it during the, the, the scripture, but Jesus turned his body toward the woman. Like he, he turned toward her, but he was speaking to Simon. He, he turns towards her, he faces her, but he's speaking so that Simon can hear it. 
and he, he tells a story. He tells a story about forgiveness and what it really means. And so we have this woman who's entering the scene completely devastated, broken, coming out of prostitution, walking in a great deal of shame still. There's, there's all this, this emotion that's playing out on her face. And the sight of Jesus puts her into this, this uh, emotional state where she's so vulnerable. And in that moment, the gospel message of forgiveness is profoundly powerful to her as Jesus tells her, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. He didn't tell her, go in shame. Go in regret. He said, go in peace because your sins have been forgiven. And so the power of forgiveness through Jesus Christ took a shameful woman who was regretting what she had done, what she had made of her life, and it was replaced with the delight of God. So friends, that is the first type of person that God saves. He saves those who have checkered pasts. No matter what we've come from, no matter where we've been, God says, I still want to save you. Now there's a second type of person I want to talk about today that God saves. And before I tell you what that, that is, I want you to read, uh, read silently with me the scripture that's next. Um, it's going to be found in Acts chapter 9, and is, this is the conversion of uh, Saul, who later became Paul, but he was known then as Saul of Tarsus. So we've already established God saves those with a checkered past, but he saves another type of person, and see if you can kind of figure out what this is. Acts chapter 9 verse 1 says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who, who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. Then they heard the sound, but he did not, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now, if Jesus can save a person with a checkered past, he can also save someone like the Apostle Paul, whom I'm going to describe as an antagonistic man, this antagonistic opponent of the gospel. Now this is probably the best example I think of somebody who would be m voted least likely to convert to Jesus. It's this guy, Saul. And yet he becomes a believer in Jesus. So here he is in his pre-Christian career persecuting, putting to death, imprisoning Christians, and he wants to do it more and he's trying to get better at it. So he's on his way to Damascus and he's trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to get better at this? And on the road there, the Bible says that Jesus met him head on. So Saul had devoted his life to crushing this new religious sect of Jerusalem uh, in, in, in Judaism, and he wanted to crush it and get rid of it and destroy it. In fact, you can look in the Bible and see the historical record of all of the people that Paul imprisoned, that he had beaten, that he killed, men, women, and children who belonged to the way. Christianity. So on the road to Damascus, he's armed with these papers that give him the authority to oppress men and women of God. The Bible says that Jesus met him face to face on the road to Damascus and he knocked him off his horse, literally knocked him off his horse and he falls to the ground and Jesus wants to know, why are you persecuting me, me? Saul is persecuting the church, so why didn't Jesus just you know, say that? No, Jesus said, because if you're persecuting the church, you're persecuting me. You're, you're going against me. And so from that day forward, Saul becomes Paul and faithfully serves God Almighty until the day God calls him home. And now in that moment, God is forcing Saul to love. He's forcing Saul to change his mind. And, and so he could not say no to this. Now, I don't know that God does this every single time, but in Paul's instance, God is saying, I'm going to save you right here, right now. Now, the reason I, I bring these two situations up for, for you is to get you to see that, that there are all kinds of people that God saves. 
He saves those whose past is embarrassing and shameful. He saves those people that you never think would be saved, that, that would never be likely. But he also saves those who are antagonistic toward the gospel, those who are angry toward God, those who are hateful toward Christians, who are skeptical toward the church. Those are the type of people that God loves to save. And so I love the fact that God showed up in the antagonism of, of Paul. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confront this, and I'm going to change you, and I'm going to save you. Now, I think we've probably, if we, if we were to do a, another survey, we've probably seen more people on the first side of the, the docket that we've talked about today, the, those who have a checkered past come to Christ, because that's how God saves some of us. But oftentimes, we don't think that God can save the person who is openly antagonistic toward the Lord. We just don't think that. Now, I've been following Christ for 35 years now and I want to tell you that in the time that I've been following him I have had more success talking to strangers and new friends than I've had talking with my own family and friends about Jesus I've had more success talking to strangers about the Lord than I have my own family and my own friends when one of my cousins found out that I was going into the ministry way back when, he actually, he, he basically said, do not show up at my house trying to convert me to Christ. He said, I don't want to hear it. I don't want, I don't want you to try to do that. So I've run into those walls like many of you have as well. And it's tough, isn't it? It's tough to think about the people in your life that don't want to hear about God because I believe in the Bible. I believe what the Bible says, which means I believe in the stark reality of hell and I believe the fact that eternity is a long time. So I'm burdened by that. And that's why after a while when, when someone's not accepting the message, I can lose heart. I start to get discouraged. I start to think that my prayers aren't, uh, aren't being heard. I, I start to believe that maybe God's arms are too short to save. That maybe God is, is kind of asleep and, and God has no plans to save that, that it's not going to happen. And so what does that make me do? That causes me to stop pleading. That causes me to stop praying and begging. It causes me to stop looking for opportunities and I'll quit trying. But what I've come to realize is that if I want to be a Christian who's part of a congregation that's going to be a city on a hill then I cannot allow my light to flicker out because I'm discouraged. So how do I become a pastor and a member of a church that leads a city on a hill church when it seems as if our lights are flickering? What do we need to remember when we get discouraged? Because maybe some of you are discouraged right now. Here are some realizations I want to come to today. I want, to, I want you to take home with you today. And the first one is this. Remember, you cannot save anyone. Remember, you cannot save anyone. We often think, well, if I was just smart enough, and if I knew my Bible well enough, and if I could argue better, or if I had 10 more minutes in that conversation before we got interrupted, or if I was more persuasive in my speech, if I was more assertive than my family member, my coworker, my friend would be saved. Maybe I could have helped them understand. Friends, it's good to have a, a burden for them. But sometimes you put the burden of salvation on you, on yourself to save your friend. And you can't do that. The world has a Savior, and His name is Jesus. So stop thinking that all of this hinges only on your persuasiveness, only the force of your personality, or only on your ability to never lose heart. God is the one who does the saving. Our part is to be salt and light. Our, our, our purpose is to be examples and love people and pray for them and invite them. That's what God wants us to do. But we are not the ones who save. You see, the prophet said this, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you and his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. So remember, you never give up. You never, you never stop hoping and praying. But remember, you can't save anybody. And that kind of gives a spoiler into my next, next bit, uh, next application point. Never stop praying in belief that God can save. Never give up praying. Because as long as you are alive, and as long as the person for whom you're praying is alive, there's a chance. Don't lose heart. Continue to believe that God is able. After all, didn't God save you? Didn't God take you from where you were and take you to where you are now? I mean, at the beginning of the service, in this little informal survey, we saw the people who came to Christ after a 20, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, 50 birth, 50 year old birthday. We saw that. Why? 
it teaches us that old dogs can learn new tricks. God can save us no matter where we are. Don't give up. The Holy Spirit can do it. God saved you. He can save others as well. In fact, God wants us to keep bothering and pestering Him about the people that we want to see saved. Now, how many fathers in this room would, would tell your son or your daughter, keep asking for that thing. Keep asking. Pester me. Bother me. Text me in the middle of the night. Wake me up when I'm sleeping. What father says that? No, fathers say, don't ask me that again or I'm going to explode and somebody's going to get hurt. We don't say that. But our father says, keep on asking. In fact, Jesus taught a parable about pestering the Lord. He said in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that sh they should always pray and not give up. Always pray and not give up. So we need to pray that no matter how antagonistic or wild our loved one is or how wayward our son or daughter is or how angry your best friend is, that God's arm is not too short to save and his ear is not too deaf to hear your cries. We are going to ask God to save what we cannot save and we're going to believe that God can do that. We're going to believe that God is willing and that he's able and we'll never stop asking. This is not so you can have another scalp on the wall or another notch in the hash mark or the spine of your Bible. It's because God is gracious, because God is good and God saves. We believe that we are evidence of God's saving power and we're saying, God, do it again. And so to be a city on a hill, we have to live out our, our faith genuinely, authentically, to the best of our ability. And that is what will change the world. Martin Lloyd-Jones a British pastor who lived many years ago said this. He said, The glory of the gospel is that when the church is absolutely different from the world, she invariably attracts it. It is then that the world is made to listen to her message, though it may hate it at first. Truth is truth. And people with checkered pasts and antagonistic opposition toward God can still be saved. And that's the type of person that we want to reach, both now in this situation and when we get into Delaware. Let's pray together. Father, today we ask you in your holy name to magnify and multiply our efforts, our feeble efforts, God, to participate with you in the gospel. Lord, help us to believe that you can do it and that you want to. So, Lord, we pray right now in your name that you would honor the wishes and prayers of those who are praying for their loved ones to, to bring salvation and Lord, we know that you can do it. And we pray in your name and for your sake. Amen.